Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, I'm going to try to get through as many questions as I possibly can. But first, I would love to say hi to you, mom and dad. Oh, dad left, but hello. <laughs> Oh, great to see you all. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all coming in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John. Sorry, you're here on YouTube. Hi, Mom and Dad. Great to see you. How are you? We're, we're, we're good. doing good. It's uh, been a nice day today. Got my exercise in. Took a mile and a half walk. Almost a mile and a half, a mile, right? Oh, uh, well. Anyway, no, it's just. I don't think it's a mile. He thinks it's a mile and a half, yeah, but well, you know. It was a good walk. We had fun. It was a good walk. Exercise is something I do more and more of all the time, you know, and it works. So, <laughs> you know, Heather, um, let's see, we're doing on the screen here. Let me, uh, you know, I, I, as you well know, I do a lot of reading. And uh, not for read, fun. No, well, I do. I do it for <laughs> fun. I mean, you like novels. I like <laughs> journal articles. And one of the questions that's come up on this show a lot is female pattern baldness. And I get a lot of you know concerns from people about uh, them losing hair, and, uh, and women we're talking about with male pattern baldness. It's a whole other thing, which, by the way, is a largely dietary disease, male pattern baldness. And and it turns out that feel, uh, female hair loss also is a um, is is well, a dietary disease. You know, but it also must have something to do with hormones. Because well, I remember when I was pregnant. I kept losing hair in the shower. Um, when I went through menopause, my hair got thinner. My hair right. still, still get, get thinner. I, and when I look at that picture that you put up uh -huh. every time, Heather, when we start that picture of me and dad, I always think, oh, my hair looked a little bit fuller then. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I notice it too that my hair, I mean, I still have hair, but I, I. Oh, yeah, you look good too. <laughs> you know, of course. Well, anyway, I got bias. I got prejudice. I, I tell you. But I don't feel like I'm losing chunks of there. And and, anyway, like, this. Can you yeah. see this this article, Heather? Okay. So the prevalence of female pattern hair loss in postmenopausal women. Uh, there's a whole whole article, another article I pulled up about the effect of estrogen. Let's just like you were mentioning. Okay. How it affects uh, how it affects female hormones, and and that meaning. Uh, when you go through puberty, when you're, of course, a, a teenager, which is when you're supposed to go through puberty, so you lose a little hair, you get uh, uh, pregnant, you lose a little hair, you finish the pregnancy, you lose a little hair. Yeah. You start nursing and, and your baby, you lose a little hair. You're done with that, you lose some hair. And also, it happens during uh, menopause time, which is when you stop your periods, or maybe a year after you stop your periods. Anyway. This is this is the article. Uh, they looked at uh, 200 women who are postmenopausal, and they looked for female pattern baldness. And you can see what it looks like here. You, can you see on the left hand side the? Uh, let's see if we can make this a little bit bigger. This is see right there. We're we're looking at. Uh, yeah. yeah we can't, oh. no. All right, there you go. That's about the best I can do. That's you one. Down that's one woman. Well, no, that's that's. Uh, Different women showing you different degrees of, of uh, loss of oh, hair. Okay, all right, all right. And then, wow. of course, then you see down at the scalp there, you see the fewer hair, uh, yeah. fewer hair follicles being present there, and you see normal hair. And, and this they, is how the one on the left is supposed to be. How many hair follicles are? And the one on the right be. is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, what they what they found out is some interesting things in this article that. Uh, but I think really point to it being, at least in part, uh, a dietary disease. So for example, they found that whether or not you had female pattern baldness depended upon how old you were, of course, but it also depended upon how overweight you were. And I don't know whether I can reach this or not. Okay. They found out that... Uh, there we go. Uh, they found out that women who are heavier had more uh, loss of hair. That was where the, the strongest correlation was the how heavy they were. And then they looked at women who were at different countries. Let's see, oh, here we go. So women who are over uh, a BMI of 25, well, uh, obesity is like 30. 
your BMI. They had more male pattern baldness. When you got older, you had more male pattern baldness. But the interesting thing is if you look down the left-hand corner of the, uh, the underlining that I have there is that the incidence of female pattern hair loss which is what we're talking about, FPLHL. So it's not male pattern baldness. It's, female pattern. It's female pattern. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and the uh, typical Westerner, postmenopausal, the chance of having this particular hair loss is like fifty-two percent. Okay. These are these are Westerners. But if you look at Asians, what they found is the prevalence, and again, that's in the bottom left-hand corner. The prevalence is like 12%, 13%, 8%, 10%, 7%, 12%. When they looked at people from Taiwan, Taiwan, uh, China, and Korea. Okay. So, you know what, you know, my thinking, uh, what we're looking at there, when we look at obesity, we're looking at the Western diet. And we look at Asian cultures, we're looking at the opposite of the Western diet. So I think you can plan on pretty much dramatically reducing, going from you know, like half the chance as you get to be menopausal, you have half the chance of having significant hair loss to, if you eat a diet like uh, somebody from China or Korea or Thailand, you know, an Asian diet, the kind of diet that we recommend, uh, your chances of having female pattern hair loss is like 10%. Like it's five times greater when you're on the Western diet. And, and they haven't, haven't even factored in the whole, whole obesity thing which they found to be a very strong factor. And uh, anyway, I, I know you've asked a lot about that, whether this is a dietary disease. And of course, you know how I think about things all the time. Of course, it's a dietary <laughs> disease. A dietary disease. Yeah, well, here, here's the evidence here that supports that. And of course, you, your estrogen levels depend upon what you eat. When a woman eats the Western diet, she has about 50% more estrogen in her body than she should have. Uh, compared to say somebody who eats a healthy diet. So that affects you in many ways, it affects your breasts, fibrocystic breast disease, breast cancer, it affects your uterus, heavy menstrual periods, uh, uh, you know, to the point where you have abnormal uterine bleeding. And so the whole body of course is affected by the food and um, you have an increased risk of, of uterine cancer and all kinds of problems. Well, here, they add another one to the consequence of the rich Western diet, resulting in obesity, resulting in high estrogen levels, uh, causing you to lose your hair. So that's where I wanted to start out today was that oh, I found that article this week yeah, as I was roaming around in the literature. I, I think it's well, true. If we, what, if we're, what if we're eating well and we still notice our hair isn't what we want it to be? Is there anything else that we can be doing? I don't know of anything that you could do, minoxidil maybe which is what you use for male pattern hair loss. Uh, oh, but that'd be, a, that's like a drug you, you take. Water on your scalp. Or, oh, you, or you used to take these pills. Originally, minoxidil came out as a pill for high blood pressure originally. That's about 30 years ago. And then they made it into one of the most popular male pattern baldness treatments, minoxidil. But anyway, you had some questions, Heather. I do, lots coming in. So uh, let's see, first question. This is from Steve. His mom has osteoporosis and he, she was told to take Fosamax. What do you think about that? I, I, I wouldn't prescribe it, you know. <laughs> uh, there's an article I did, or actually it's a, a video. It's called uh, The Broken Bone Business. You'll find it on the website, The Broken Bones and Business. And what it does is it looks at Fosamax or similar drugs, bisphosphonates they're called and shows that the benefits are really, really small. And you run an increased risk of uh, femoral fractures and uh, you have necrosis of the jaw. I mean, there's some oral surgeons still, I believe, but many dentists and oral surgeons won't do any tooth repair or any significant tooth repair on somebody who's been taking uh, Fosamax or similar drugs because there's such a high rate of, of death of the jaw bones related to this drug. So it, it just plain and simple is, is an ineffective drug which has significant toxicity and side effects. So that's why I would prescribe it. If it was supposed to make your bone better, make your jaw better too. Yeah, you would, but it doesn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are a whole list of sites. It's called the Broken Bone Business. It's a lecture I did a while back. You'll find it on the website. 
So what will you do? What, what, does a, what does a person do? Well, the first thing I've talked to you about is that most of the women who flunk the bone mineral density tests, their bones are plenty strong. Uh, in a study that you'll again find on the website, it's under Hot Topics, uh, Osteoporosis, first article. It talks about how based on the bone mineral test, bone mineral density test, nearly 70% of women after the age of 65 flunk the test. Yeah, they're either diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia. Osteopenia, yeah, osteopenia or osteoporosis. And uh, you say, your first thought is, well, is there something wrong here? I mean, are women designed effectively so they lose their bones when they get over the age of 65? Well, the truth of the matter is, it's just a normal physiologic change that takes place when you go through menopause. Now, let me explain to you what that is is when you're in your reproductive years, you're getting ready to have a baby and a nurse a baby, your body stores an extra two pounds of mineral, okay? When you go through menopause, when you're not in the childbearing age anymore, it makes no sense to carry around that extra two pounds of mineral, so it dumps that two pounds of mineral. Now, what a bone mineral density test does is it shoots photons through your bone. And if you have minerals in the bone, it's gonna block them and you're gonna get a higher bone mineral density. But that's not where the strength of the bones comes from. It's not the minerals. They just kind of sit there in the bone architecture waiting to be to become the bones of the fetus. Or so the, they're like a bank. Uh, uh, well, yeah, or a closet or something like that. Okay. Just like sit there. And, and I think the way for you to think about it is that, and you understand that minerals are just part of the architecture. They're not the strength of the bones. Remember when you were um, in junior high or well, probably junior high, elementary school, you had a blackboard. And uh, on that blackboard, you would make marks with something called chalk, which is 100% mineral. And you remember how you broke the chalk? This is the slightest pressure. They probably have to be our age to remember chalk. I think so. Blackboards. <laughs> I know. I'm sure they don't have them anymore. But some of you remember this. But the point being is, is how... This is solid mineral, yet it's extremely fragile. Well, the, the other thing to remember from the old days, and I, I participated in this, as many of you did, is when you ate, for example, uh, chicken, you got all the flesh stripped out of, stripped out of the bones, let's say the leg, and you ended up with bone, and you, you could bend the bone like this. You could even almost tie it in knots. That's where the strength of the bone comes from. It comes from the tissue, not the mineral. It just so happens that, you know, as you get older, lose bone tissue, you have less place for the mineral to sit. So that's where the correlation comes. But you shouldn't plan on having bad bones. You shouldn't even take a bone mineral density test. In fact, they weren't even approved uh, until about 25 years ago. Uh, the uh, Medicare wouldn't pay for them. They, they felt that they were just so useless. So um, that's what they're treating with uh, with Fosamax, which uh, you know, is phosphonates, so it's the general categories. Is is there, yeah, they're treating you with the idea that bones are part of the, or minerals are part of the strength of the bones. If you, Almost irrelevant. Okay, yes. well, if you took those things right. that they recommend, would they actually go into your bones? Minerals? Yeah, whatever oh, you're uh, taking. Are, I mean, would they actually go into your bones? So the next time you had a bone marrow test, is yeah, yeah it'll, it'll be a little bit. It would show. Yeah, okay. yeah and that, of course, that's what it's based on. Yeah, is okay. the fact that you have a better looking bone marrow density next time you take a test after you take this drug. <laughs> they don't. Nobody goes and and ties your bones in knots <laughs> or anything. In fact, that's why it's so hard to diagnose osteoporosis. The diagnosis of osteoporosis is to be made when somebody has fractures uh, due to a force that you wouldn't expect them to have a fracture from. You know, like they, they put their a hand down on a desk and break their wrist uh, or some slight fall. I mean, the fact that you've had fractures with some unusual, unusually light stress is the best way to diagnose whether you got a problem or not. Anyway. But, but even if you do that, you don't still recommend 
Not Fosamax. Any of these things when you do when you do have osteoporosis, that's no, not what you not recommend. Fosamax. I don't have I don't have any drugs that I recommend except for estrogen, yeah. hormone replacement therapy. So estrogen builds bones. Period. Um, I recommend uh, estrogen as as for somebody who really has a high risk of having a fracture is I will put them on a skin cream that contains estrogen to build their bone back. And I'll also put them on antacids because loss of bone is due to consuming a diet with lots of acid in it. And that's the Western diet. The Western diet is high in protein, which breaks down into amino acids. And the acid type that is in meat animal products is very, very strong. It's a sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid. It comes from the breakdown of sulfur-containing amino acids, methionine and cysteine. So anyways, you get this acid load in the body, the primary buffering system of the body. As every, every medical student learns in their first physiology class, the primary bus buffering system of the body is the bones. The bones release alkaline material, which neutralizes the acid. It's part of the whole system, so you don't die. Anyway, you get osteoporosis mainly from the high acid, high protein Western diet. Exercise plays a role and so does sunshine. So you need a little bit of moderate, safe exercise. You know, even people with, with strong bones, if they get hit by a car, they'll break. <laughs> anyway, uh, a, a diet with no animal protein, okay? I even limit the amount of, of concentrated plant protein foods. And uh, I know there's some argument about that, but it's not great enough to overcome the research. And the research shows things like research done by David Jenkins from University of Toronto. It shows that plant proteins will cause the body to lose calcium. This, this would be, he did his studies on wheat proteins. And then there are other studies done on soy protein and how protein causes the body to lose calcium. So, you know, even your plant proteins and somebody who I suspect is at high risk of fractures. You know, I'll tell them, cut back on the beans, peas, and lentils. You know, don't be eating isolated soy protein, which is something we recommend against anyway for anybody. Don't be eating setan, which is isolated gluten, or isolated wheat protein. Well, so, and now there's all the, the fake meats like pea protein. Oh, yeah, I stay away and, from those two. Yeah, there's just so many different kinds of proteins that are made into these fake animal foods. And they all they all have a significant effect on the bones, even your plant proteins, not as much as animal proteins, so not way different, but enough so that you lose calcium by taking isolated soy or wheat proteins. I mean, the studies are there. So you, you pick up a large amount of calcium loss in the urine is what you do. Um, but, but anyway, no, I don't prescribe that drug. Uh, as I say, a, a good food, an alkaline diet, which is what ours is. It's, it's an alkaline diet. Uh, a good food, walk around a little bit, sunshine some of your body. And of course, that, that varies a lot depending upon a whole bunch of things, how much sunshine you need. Not much, a little bit. Anyway, uh, I think you'll find that a drug does more harm than good. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Arlene. She says her TSH went from three to 10 in the last year. And her doctor says to just keep taking the level of thyroxine. How she's she always been doing it. Should she be doing something different? She needs to take more. She needs to take more levothyroxine. So if she's if she's 10, that indicates she's not getting an adequate amount of supplementation. You sh your goal should be to, to decrease the TSH to a, a level of uh, two, two micro-international units. If you decrease it below that, like it's one or, or a half of a unit, then you're over-treating. You're giving too much thyroid. If you're above two, then you're giving too little. And I would say most physicians treat when it gets around four or six, certainly at 10, I can't imagine a doctor not wanting to increase the dose. Now, I wanna add one more thing. It's something that I've discovered through, you know, 36 years of seeing patients, uh, is that when they, people change their diet, their TSH levels improve. 
And we did that. We just did a sub-analysis of our 1,703 people. We looked at their TSH levels when they came in, and we took a subgroup of them, and we checked them when they left. And there was about a one micro-international unit improvement in that seven-day period of time. So there's something going on with the gut or the efficiency of the thyroid a hormone that their body makes or or the thyroid that they take that a, a good diet allows it to be more effective again that's just a, an observation nothing published uh, but we saw we took about we looked at about 200 people and saw that kind of uh, improvement in uh, TSH level with just 7 days but you need to do it you need to you need whatever you do today Okay, say you increased your, your T4, which is your Synthroid. You increased it today. You need to check in three to six weeks to see what the effect was because it takes three to six weeks for the Synthroid, which is T4, to be converted to T3, which is the active form, which is the form that lowers your, or raises your TSH level. So you can't go cha change your thyroid dose and check again tomorrow. Or next week, you got to wait three to six weeks to see the, the whether or not you're on the right dose. And they make thyroid doses like tenths of a milligram difference. So you can really fine tune this if you want. Somewhere around two in micro international units is where you're heading. Thyroid supplementation is one of the safest, most effective pill treatments that I offer patients. And you know me, I don't. I take <laughs> far more people off drugs than I put on. Probably for every 10 people or 20 people I I see, that I, I take them off drugs as opposed to the one I put on drug medication. But I'm a doctor. Yeah. I got a, I got four medical, oh my God, more than that. I probably have, I'm licensed in, let's guess, maybe pretty much all 50 states. But I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm a licensed medical doctor and I have a prescription pad. And fortunately, Dr. Lim and I, we don't have to use our pads very often because people get well and because a good share of you should not be on the medications that are being prescribed. What the indication is there, whether you change your diet or not, you're being overtreated because that's what we're taught to do as doctors. We're taught to treat. You as a patient expect treatment. So you're at fault too. Oh, doc, I spent all this time in your office. I paid a hundred dollars and I didn't get a prescription. I wasted my time. You know, that's the attitude of a lot of people. You should be glad if you got out of the office without a prescription. <laughs> All you do is tell me to eat potatoes, beans, and rice. <laughs> what kind of an office well, is it is that, right? <laughs> that's, that's not going to help the thyroid, but yeah, it, I'm sure you know, Heather. You've been you've been doing this for probably 20 years now, and uh, it's really unusual for someone to not be able to reduce or stop all their medication that we take care of. Again, because you didn't need it in the first place, you know. Uh, the proper indications that are have been established by research, et cetera, and also standard recommendations says you're being overtreated. So we eliminate a lot of it. And then, of course, we fix the problem. And uh, our results on 1,703 1, people is that we're able to stop or reduce medications in approximately 90 percent of the cases okay and that's only in seven days that's in seven if days. you had waited two or three months you you'd it would probably be a few more. Find there would be a few more people it would be a few more uh, mary but you know that people get well so fast i don't know their blood pressure drops so quickly their sugars drop so quickly that you usually see most of what you're going to get in seven days. But you, see, but as people lose weight, you also see changes. Yeah, they keep getting in, better in their in their blood pressure and their yeah everything. As Tiffany says, you didn't get sick overnight. That's right. You know, it's going to take you a while to get better, but it, it usually takes a lot less time than you thought it would. Your body's amazing. Just give it half a chance. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Marcus. He's wondering if you could speak on Bell's palsy. This just started for him two days ago. Bell's palsy? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a tough one. You yeah. know, Bell's palsy, uh, you know, what happens is you lose the seventh nerve. And so you end up with your face drooping, your lip drooping, and so on. It could be on either side. It's the seventh nerve, the facial nerve that comes like this. 
it gets paralyzed. Why does it get paralyzed? Well, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That, you know, it could be a viral infection. It could be some type of toxicity. But when, when I... Come back? Could it ever yeah, it come, comes back. Comes back? Not mm-hmm. always, but uh, it does come back. It, it takes a long time. It takes a while. There's no treatment. You know, doctors will give steroids with the idea that somehow the seventh nerve is being trapped up here and as it leaves the foramen and the skull, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't work. You just wait. So anyway, the way I would think about, about Bell's policy is each and every nerve has a blood supply. And you know where I'm going there. You know, <laughs> depending upon where the blood supply is compromised, you name the disease. Like if you have a compromise in the eye, we call that macular degeneration. If you have that one artery, there's only one artery that goes to your inner ear, just one little artery. If you compromise that, you have hearing loss, vertigo, and or tinnitus. Uh, you close the artery to the brain, you end up with a stroke. I'm very familiar with that, that fella. Close the artery to the heart, you have a heart attack. Close the artery to your penis. Now, that's a big problem. You become impotent. That's how most men become impotent as they have poor circulation to their their spongy organ. It stays unsponged. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it close the arteries to the leg, you get uh, intermittent claudication and gangrene and kidneys, you know, you get kidney failure. It's just, you got this 60,000 miles of blood vessels, arteries, arterioles, veins, capillaries, etc., And they get diseased from the food. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what I would say. If, you know, in my imagination, and it's just my imagination because I don't know of any research that would support that, but it, it's reasonable that it would be the cause that I told you. Problem with the blood vessel, but you know what so we there's just, no, well, there's no other known cause for it, is there? Well, we virus. Oh, well, virus. You know, you know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor okay. doesn't know. It's virus. It's either genetics or it's got a virus. <laughs> Isn't that right? I mean, actually, I, you know. Anyway, that's that's part of the standard okay. practice of medicine. Right. How'd I get this? Well, it's probably a virus, or maybe you're kooky, or you're neurotic, or whatever. <laughs> you inherited it. It's never something sitting right in front of you, like it's your dinner plate. That's why you got the problem. Thank you. Okay, next question. Do you remember last Sunday the question yeah. came up about that supplement, that PEA? Yeah. It had a really long name. Yeah. yeah. Did you happen to look at it? It's I, I, I types did, of pain, I fibromyalgia. What do you think about that? I did. I, I forgot what I what I what I found. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did have a chance to look at it, and uh, I didn't do any deep research into it though. Um, it's right here. It's uh, P I. I don't know. I know. P E P E A. Something like that. No, I didn't. I I just looked it up, found out that it was uh, some type of a pain reliever. And I stopped at that. Yeah, it's a supplement. Yeah. Uh, um, fatty acid right here. Okay. Oh, no, that's not it. Friends. Right. I found it. I found it last. Oh, here it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, palm, Remember what we palm talked about? It's lethal. from fats. Yeah. From egg, egg yolks. Well, there must egg not egg. have been anything wonderful about it, or you probably would have remembered, right? Well, it's a chemical made from fat. There you go. So that makes it suspect. But I, I, I would have to, you know, go this to Google. Where I got it, yeah. Or the National Library of Medicine. I would have to. It's something see if that they did you, any you random. Yeah. Yeah, it's a supplement. You know what I would do? What I tell you on that? I, I, mean, I, I may have let you down a little bit because I didn't do any thorough research on it, but probably because I didn't think it was worth the trouble. Is, what I would tell you is you're going to run into all kinds of recommendations. Uh, and you should hold us to the same standard. All kinds of recommendations, like for example, this particular pill, let's assume it was to treat some kind of painful condition. Well, first of all, you wanna decide, is it gonna hurt you? You don't wanna try anything that's gonna hurt you. And then you figure out what's it gonna cost you in time, money, and effort to do a little experiment. And uh, if it comes up positive, not gonna kill you, it's worth your time, money, and effort, then test it, you know, test it, but don't test it for very long. If something's going to work, it's going to work within four months. You now that, that I, I come to that particular point of view from my many years in medicine. You know, I've seen so many people injured, car accidents, auto accidents, gunshot wounds, 
you know, falling off major structures, you know, all kinds of things that I've seen. You know, after all, I, I used to, I used to, I run the Honolulu, the Queens Medical Center, Honolulu Emergency Room. So I saw everything. And I watched some of the patients heal and they, they would heal even from major fractures and lacerations. They would heal in like, you know, two, three, four months. If, 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 if you're not dramatically better and obviously better in, let's just say, four months, give up. But I would say, you don't need to test what we recommend any more than 12 days. But I would, you know, under difficult circumstances, I'd ask you to give us the same courtesy. Give us four months. You know, and I tell you to eat potatoes and rice and corn and give up your supplements and your harmful medications. Give us four months. You know, it seems like pretty much everybody else who does it is pleased. So anyway, but as we've talked about before, we're just going back to the traditional diet. Uh, did, I, did I mention I, I got a paper accepted uh, from one of the in one of the scientific journals? Yeah, well, I wrote a paper. I wrote a paper on climate change. It ha hasn't been accepted for a long time. I think I think it's going to be published during the next couple of months. Uh, I wrote an article about climate change and what I proposed because we need to fix the climate. But I'm not going to go into that. And people are sick you know, with all kinds of chronic diseases and plus. With the COVID-19, you come to realize that if you don't eat well and take good care of yourself, you have a dramatic increase in your risk of dying from infections. Anyway, what I did is I did a whole paragraph there, which focused on what we need to do. You know, if we want to get healthy as far as our, our chronic diseases, our obesity, our high blood pressure, our diabetes, what do we need to do? You know, what, what do we need to do to set us up so we have less chance of dying from a, a viral infection like COVID-19? And what do we need to do for the planet? What we need to do is we need to change back to traditional eating. You, if you think about these in, in this perspective, it becomes really easy to understand what we're recommending. And that is you need to eat like people have always eaten, except for the last 50 years or maybe 100. Maybe it's been 150 years, but not much longer than that. And otherwise, all large, successful populations of people have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. And so what I suggest in this paper, which makes my paper unique, is that you just have to show respect for your ancestry. You know, for well, grandma and grandma. I like it for that reason. Well, they're going to publish it. You know, you, you come from Mexico or Central America. You come from a population where they were known as the people of the corn. You know, you 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 come from Asia, and likely you're known for as a having having an ancestry of people who ate rice. In in South America, it would be potatoes, and in the breadbasket of the world, it would be bread. You know, we're starch eaters, so this shouldn't be a great a, a great chasm for you to go from where you are eating a diet. So I've been around for 50 years. That's made kings and queens of sick for thousands to going to a diet that your grandma and grandpa ate. You know, show some respect for your ancestry. Anyway, they're publishing that. I, don't know. I like that. I, like I don't that. know how we got on that subject, but <laughs> I, I might have another article published too uh, coming up. I, I think it's been accepted. It's in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's about Laquimbi. Uh, it's about the new drugs that are used to treat Alzheimer's. And I think they're going to publish it because these are such terrible drugs. Laquimbi and... I and you talked to them about the date, date. desfroxamine too, right? The my, my, desfroxamine. My, that's what the letter's about. They only allowed like 750 words in a letter to the other, so not, my, not many. Okay. Anyway, I wrote them and I told them that, you know, these drugs are very toxic. They cost like twenty six dollars and $28,000 a year. You got to go in and get an infusion every week or two. Okay, that's not so fun. Go to the doctor, get, get, get your vein punctured and have them infuse the drug every week or two. And the toxicity is 20% of the people get brain bleeds and brain swelling. Yeah. And anyway, in this article to JAMA, which I wrote, and I think it's accepted, we'll see. What I pointed out is there's a safer, cheap, 
generic way to treat where you'll get better results than any of these expensive expensive drugs. Which I assume you sent the references along with it. Yeah, I only allowed I was only allowed five references. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, monoclonal monoclonal antibodies is what they are. They attack. They they synthesize them in a the laboratory and they infuse them and they attack something we call tau proteins, which is a whole backwards way of looking at Alzheimer's. However, if you tune, tune in tomorrow on Chef AJ's show at 10 o'clock, I'll be talking about this. Right. I'll be talking about Alzheimer's and you know if that fact that it's due to aluminum poisoning and so on. But it'd be real nice if the Journal of the American Medical Association published my letter. I feel almost accepted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Next question. Lots of them coming in. Uh, this is from Minor Grace. Can eating this way help with trigeminal myalgia? Trigeminal neuralgia. I, knew it was so, I think it's an N. Trigeminal neuralgia. Now that's, a, again, a, a facial nerve type thing where you get terrible pain. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, I don't, I don't know. And I've seen a few cases in my in my career, and of course, I always told them to eat a good diet. You know me. <laughs> and uh, whether or not it respond because the trigeminal neuralgia was due to a vascular problem, just just like Bell's palsy, which again most people say is due to a virus. But what if it's not? What if it's due to a blood vessel closing down? You know, then of course you have to focus again on the diet. The nice thing, you know, the nice thing about what we recommend, Mary and Heather and I, the team, is it never does any harm. It cuts your food bill by 60 to 80%. It's kind to the planet. It's kind to animals. You know, it gives you a good bowel movement. Good grief. Why wouldn't you try it? You're right about the George owner on it. That's a facial, facial nerve. I yeah. remember a few things from 50 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, next question. This is about Meniere's disease. Okay. Any suggestions for that? This person follows your diet, loves what you do, but hasn't had any luck with this. Uh, Meniere's, you know, you can look it up, Heather, but Meniere's is likewise due to inner ear vascular yeah. problems. And as I explained to you, you'll find this. Well, if you have access to my favorite articles, you'll find it. We don't have to. Just look up Spencer. Spencer and hearing loss. Uh, you do it. You Google should show it. Should find it. It's not a hard article to find. Uh, Spencer was a ear, nose, and throat doctor who published research on how inner ear disease is uh, due to the Western diet. What he and several of his colleagues did is they went around the world and looked at the incidence of inner ear disease. Do I have it right, in Meniere's? Yeah, it's an inner yeah. ear disorder that mm -hmm. causes dizziness and the vertical yeah. spinning. Well, he, he went around the world uh, with his uh, friends and they saw that there was a direct correlation, population by population, country by country, between death from heart disease and hearing loss or Meniere's or vertigo or tinnitus or whatever you want to call it. And they made this correlation. And what their theory was, and which is true, is you have one artery that goes to the inner ear and it gets plugged up. Now, Spencer, he ran into trouble after he got back from his touring. He developed a severe vertigo to where he couldn't even stand up. He was so sick. And he remembered what he'd learned in his European trip and he changed his diet and he got rid of his, his meniers or his vertigo. And then what he did is he treated the next 400 patients with high frequency hearing loss, and half of them got improvement with a healthy, healthy diet. And so Spencer believed, and I see in my practice too, that some people, you know, maybe half, have improvement in their hearing, they get rid of the ringing in their ears, and they stop the episodes of dizziness by improving the circulation back to the inner ear. Anyway, you can you can find Spencer's work. Spencer hearing loss. Diet, put, put that into Google. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Norma. Do you have any advice for someone with bronchiectasis causing weight loss with a BMI of 
bronchiectasis, right? Is that right, bronchiectasis? That, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Heather. <laughs> but what was uh, bronchiectasis? Well, bronchiectasis is where you get an infection in your bronchial tubes. And it's due to, you know, chronic lung disease, smoking, uh, you know, eating the Western diet gives you a good share of the diseases you get in the lungs too. And you get pockets of infection in these, uh, in these bronchial tubes that are destroyed, basically. In other words, you, have, you had a bronchial tube that had muscles and contractions and had a normal mucosa and <clears throat> through uh, damage, you know, again, cigarette smoking and diet would do it. You end up uh, destroying the musculature and the rest of the integrity of this tube so that now it's expanded and collects mucus and infection. Sometimes they go in and they cut it out. You mentioned she had a BMI that was elevated. Can't hear you. It was low. It was 13.5. Okay. Well, then that didn't have anything to do with BMI. Well, that's okay. You, what do you do about that? Well, what I remember is you occasionally treat it with antibiotics. And sometimes people have surgery for bronchiectasis. But uh, would a healthy diet help? Again, you know, you know me. I'm going to tell you yes. You just republished, didn't you just republish the article I wrote on uh, better breathing, Heather? Sure did. Yeah. I did. I wrote it, it in my May 2003 newsletter, and we updated it. <clears throat> but it's about how diet affects your lungs. And what I talked about is there were a couple of meetings at that time in Texas where pulmonologists got together and they talked about how a high fat diet was a predecessor to asthma. And that people who had asthma, they presented papers at this meeting. People who had asthma who changed to a healthy diet. And you know what I mean by healthy diets. You know, in the direction of a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, less dairy, less meat, less oil, et cetera. They're never going to go to the extent that I've taught you. But anyway, that, at that time, they had this particular meeting, May in 2003. So I got kind of excited about carrying a little bit further. And what I talked about as far as your lung function goes is there's many ways diet helps. You know, one is just all the fat you have in your abdomen and around your chest, but particularly in your abdomen, it makes it hard for you to take a deep breath. So, you know, losing the weight is going to free up your rib cage and your diaphragm, and you're going to breathe a lot easier. The other thing is, is uh, I talked to you about blood sludging and how when you eat a high fat diet, high in animal fat or vegetable fat, the blood cells all stick together in clumps. And that blood sludging with a drop in oxygen tension has been actually shown in research done on the lungs and how it drops the pulmonary function by about 20%. Okay, so you've got an improvement in circulation, you lost the excess weight. There's also an allergy component from the food, particularly the dairy. You talk about wheat being troublesome too, I haven't found it too often, but particularly the dairy, which causes bronchospasm to occur. So that's another thing you do. Um, the other thing you need to realize is that chronic reflux, which again is fixed with the diet, you know, gastroesophageal reflux disease, where you reflux your stomach contents up into your back of your throat, and then you inhale it, and you get chronic bronchitis, inflammation, asthma. I mean, this is standard medical talk I'm giving you right now, is that you get reflux into your lungs, into your airways uh, from stomach acid. Comes up, <laughs> breathe it in, you burn your lungs. And so standard medicine is to raise the head of the bed, keep, keep uh, with gravity, keep the, the acid in the stomach. And uh, whatever else doctors say to do with asthma, take drugs, I guess. <laughs> but if you just if you just change your diet, uh, most of the reflux goes away and uh, you have to give up the dairy and the animal foods and you have to be careful about certain vegetables. Okay. They're irritating that raw vegetables are quite irritating to the stomach and they make your, your reflux to persist. It keeps going on. So you give up the onions, green peppers, cucumbers, radishes, cooked food is what you want to eat. So in lots of ways, if somebody has bronchiectasis, it's, you know, it's done. You know, your, your, your bronchioles are pretty much done. They're destroyed. The nice thing is, is you'll probably live a normal long life with just the only problem being you're coughing up all this, 
well, false smelling mucus is what it has. They end up coughing up. Yeah, yeah well, because you, know, you got these pockets of infection, Mary. You don't want to have bronchial. Away. You don't want to have bronchial tubes that you know cause you to move the mucus up so you can yeah. cough it up. Yeah. You get these because the the tubes are the integrity of the tubes are destroyed. Okay. So fluid collects in these dilated segments of bronchi, and it becomes stagnant. And it gets infected. And so you have, like I say, you have pretty purulent mucus coming out of your lungs. And that's why antibiotics help on occasion. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from George. He's had two aneurysms treated with endovascular coiling and a stent. Had no idea he'd been given a stent. Now he must take an aspirin every day and wonders if he should be worried about the stent and the aspirin. Okay, but I'm not quite sure what he's talking about, about aneurysms and getting a stent. So I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of blinded by the fact that I really don't know. I'm a little confused. Where the aneurysm was? Yeah, you know, usually aneurysms are in the brain, you know, blood arteries. So they're, uh, they're, they're a lack of integrity of an artery. And so it bulges out or ruptures in or ruptures out. And you have many aorta, aortic aneurysms, and sometimes you have brain aneurysms. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think what he said also was he had a drug-eluting stent. Then I would guess that he had a stent placed in his heart artery. So does that sound like what he had is he had a, a stent put in? And now he's told he has to take aspirin for a lifetime. Is that right? Yes. Well, it's called dual platelet therapy, dual platelet. Anyway, what you do is post these surgeries, heart surgery, angioplasty, where they put a stent in. These stents have a uh, some cancer-like drugs in them, so they're called a drug-eluting stents. And what was found is, you know, we went through a progression where all we did was rupture the artery in the heart, called angioplasty with a balloon catheter. And then the next phase was to put a, a metal prop in there called a bare metal stent, okay? And what we found out was you'd reclose the arteries somewhere between 40 and 50% of the time by, by, by these procedures. So they, they started impregnating cancer-like drugs in the stents, which kept the arteries from closing. And that, that was good. But what they found out is that three months later or three years later, there was sudden death. They were having clots form. So dual platelet therapy consists of aspirin and Plavix or another similar drug. So dual, dual platelet therapy. And I think- Do they have to take it forever? No, you know, that's the way it started out, Mary. Is, is you know, the doctors are really scared because they went from over 90% of the, of the uh, stents being drug-eluting stents. Yeah. After this meeting that they had where they published this, it went down to 60%. They stopped using the drug-eluting stents. They were really scared. And so what they decided to do is they had to put everybody on drug-eluting stents on anti-clotting regimes, you know, the dual platelet blood thing. All right, well, well, the way the story goes, this is it started out, they said, okay, all your patients, they decided every patient had a stent, needed to be on this for a lifetime. And then when they started looking at what was going on, what they realized was that bare metal stents don't require this dual antiplatelet therapy. It's dual antiplatelet therapy. It's the official name. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> <laughs> DAPT. Uh, yeah, dual antiplatelet therapy. Yeah. What they decided was, was uh, that if you have a bare metal stent, you really don't need that. Maybe take an aspirin. But if you had a, a drug-eluting stent, you needed to take an aspirin plus Plavix. That's because when you put these cancer drugs in there, the, the body doesn't heal well. But the way it turns out is all of the drug that's in this stent is eluded within three months. So the need for the drug really stops after three months. As far as I'm aware, and I can pull out a half a dozen studies for you right now, as far as, far as I'm aware of, the official recommendation is to stop dual antiplatelet therapy, stop the Plavix, three to 12 months after the angioplasty. 
That's the official recommendations. Now, you may end up, the argument may be, and I, I know how doctors feel, it's hard to get patients to not take any drugs. You know, it kind of goes the other way is that if a patient dies with a bag full of drugs next to their bed, then the doctor can't be faulted. So it's really hard for us to take you off everything. So what doctors are doing now is they're leaving people on a baby aspirin and stopping the Flavix. Now, you didn't need to hear all that. I really tell me, you really <laughs> didn't need to know all that. So it, I, I, I don't, probably the aspirin's doing very little good, but your, your, your physicians are a little afraid to stop the aspirin too. Okay, thank you. Let's see, next question. This is from Rita. She wants to know what causes reactive thrombocytosis and how can you reverse it? Wow, reactive That's a thrombocytosis. Big word. <laughs> well, thrombocytosis would mean that you have a lot of platelets. Okay, that's what it means to me. Thrombocytosis is a, a disease where your bone marrow makes a lot of platelets. You know, look that up for me. I don't know what reactive thrombo, uh, thrombocytosis would be. Thrombocytopenia is where there's, there's too few platelets and you bleed. Thrombocytosis would be you have an excess amount of platelets. But reactive to what? I, I I just don't see the connection. It's, it's just that I don't know. Reactive thrombocytosis. Yeah, I'm normally high platelets. I'm normally high platelets. Yeah, got it right again. You think <laughs> I you, you think I rehearsed these questions before we started? Uh, that's what happens when you work hard for 50 years. You Most know. patients are asymptomatic. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Well, you have an increased risk of blood clotting. So what would I ask you to do? Well, what makes the blood clot most is animal fat. Okay, animal fat in, in the laboratory dish and other experimentation, animal flat fat makes the platelets, which are your blue blood clotting discs. Okay, when you form a clot, there are platelets involved, there are blood clotting proteins involved. Anyway, you end up making this clot so you don't end up squirting all your blood onto the floor and you stop bleeding. And anyway, um, uh, if you eat animal fat, then the platelets get very sticky. They want to, they want to, they're adhesive, we call it. And if you eat animal fat, you increase the blood clotting proteins, particular blood clotting factor seven, which is the strongest factor associated with blood clots in the heart, in other words, heart attacks. So if you want to have more thrombocytosis, more risk of blood clotting, eat animal fats, eat cheese. <laughs> Beef, pork. Now, if you want to thin the blood, you just do the opposite. You end up eating polyunsaturated fats, which cause the blood to break up and you know not, not clot together and causes you to have an excess of bleeding. I would ask you to do neither. Don't use the vegetable fat. Don't use the animal fat. Your body will naturally re resort to a normal amount of clotting that's appropriate for the situation if you will feed it properly. Then you don't have an increased risk of bleeding. I don't have a risk of increased risk of blood clot. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's see. Next question. This is from Ray. He's wanting to know how to prevent sarcopenia on a starch-based diet. Oh, I love that one. That's so good. <laughs> I, did, I did a whole, a whole lecture presentation on sarcopenia. The way that the uh, supplement industry and the meat, dairy, and egg industry are scaring people people at my age, is to tell them that they're going to lose their muscle as they get older. It's called sarcopenia. In other words, sarco, muscle, penia, which is you know, I don't know, small or go away or something. Sarcopenia. So they sell these supplements. They sell these uh, amino acid supplements and liquids in a bottle, protein, et cetera. And the meat, dairy, and egg industry, because they're pushing protein too, they sell you on the idea that you need to eat more meat to make the muscles not, not, uh, not become weaker or, or smaller or whatever as you waste get older. Away. Waste away. Waste away. The, the, the thing is, is that review studies, and I pulled these out, I gave them to you Heather a while back. I'm not sure they won't be easy to reach right now, but I, I pulled out the review studies, the one that were done independently of the drug and the food companies. And their conclusion is taking these supplements or eating more protein will not prevent uh, sarcopenia. 
But I'll tell you what will. It's exercise. Every study turns out that if you exercise as an older person, you will maintain your muscle mass, but not by eating high protein diets. If protein that you eat was stored in the body, it'd be stored in the muscles. And because of all the protein the Americans eat, it all looked like bodybuilders. And they don't. And they don't. <laughs> and they, they, all the fat that they eat, guess what they look like? <laughs> so protein is not stored. It's excreted out of the body through the kidneys after being having some process done in the liver. It's a sales pitch. It's, <laughs> yeah, don't buy it. Actually, you got to exercise. Uh, resistance exercises are what's are most effective. Whatever resistant exercises are. What are they, Megan? Yeah. Well, the, like the bands we use. There, yeah, bands, yeah, that's what I use. Those. The, band, the resistance bands, yeah, those are very important. But that's what the research says. You know, again, I have to go back to what I've told you so many times is you're involved in a business and you're involved with people and people in businesses like to make money. OK, so they're going to sell you stuff, whether it's good for you or not, as long as they don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> but they get caught, at least at least in this corner of town, they get caught. Thank you. OK, next question. We've got a few more minutes. I think we can at least fit a couple more in. Vanessa is wanting you to address lab grown food. Oh, oh yucky, yucky. I I, I, you know, that sounds so, so, so wrong to take cells in a culture and to grow the cells into something that tastes and looks like chicken. Oh, at least you don't get the salmonella with it. There you go. There you probably go. Don't get bones either. Probably probably get just, bones. Get the, just get the full weight. You don't right? get mad cow prions. You don't yeah. get staphylococci. You know what they describe? They they describe uh, uh, a chicken factory as fecal soup because over half the specimens are highly infected with with salmonella and staph and other types of bacteria. So therefore, lab grown meat yeah, at least would be better than that. It's cleaner. There you go. It's cleaner. I would suspect that if they're going to take the trouble to make it look like it, sound like it, be like it, it's like the duck, right? You know, <laughs> it's, it's, probably, like a duck, it's probably a duck. Like a duck probably. It's just going to be high protein, uh, probably just high protein. They're probably somewhere, not, you know, figured out how to get all the fat out, but it, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your bones and kidneys. And I don't think it's a good idea. Thank you. you don't need meat. <laughs> you, it hurts you. And I know it's hard to get over, but you'll do better not eating any meat or dairy, which is, you know, flies in the face of everything you've been taught. But look around you. Look at the people in the shopping centers. Look at your, your friends and relatives, people that you work with. They're sick. We're not all specimens of health. You look terrible. <laughs> but I, it's just, you know, it's shocking. Sometimes I think I must be kidding myself until I look out in the world and see <laughs> these people are really oh, terrible. Yeah. And it isn't from lab grown chicken. <laughs> okay, so not a good idea. We want you to eat plants, real plants, right? Okay, so it's uh, it's six o'clock. We've run out of time. That hour went by so fast. All right. Well, we could, we could leave people with? yeah. Well, I just wanted to talk. We had a really great time yesterday. We talked about diabetes and gave them a really interesting discussion that flowed easily on diabetes. And we're gonna talk about heart disease next Saturday and cancer the next Saturday. So we're on a series of, uh, uh, it's called McDougal's Medicine, a challenging second opinion. So we're doing that. And uh, then we're gonna have the award ceremony and, and Palm Desert, Palm Springs, some Palm, some, some Palm, some Palm, Palm, Desert. Palm Desert. And we're gonna do that September 10th, where I'm gonna get a, a, win an award, believe it or not. <laughs> So it's a, it's one I, I I look forward to getting. I really do. And we're doing that. And when's our next program, Heather? October thirteenth. But we're already filling up. It's it's great. We're getting. We're getting well, you know, Heather, you're going to have to add more programs. <laughs> you know, I, I know. <laughs> she will. I know. As soon as it's necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, we will meet your needs. So <laughs> as more and more people get interested in being healthy. And the way not you know not wasting money on drugs and supplements and stuff, then 
you know, we'll put in other programs for you. We'll be there. We got a great staff. We'll be there. Amazing, yeah. amazing experience. We love it. We can easily branch out. So anyway, sign up. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mom and Dad. That was a great hour. If anyone right. wants to see more of you, they can tune in to Chef AJ live tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be there tomorrow. And of course, there's always Saturday night. Remember, bring your friends and relatives. Sunday to night. Sunday night. Sunday. Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time. And let us meet them or let them meet us. And, uh, you know, they won't find it. We're so scary. And they might discover we have something worthwhile to help them with. Yeah. That'd be great. We yeah. look forward to it. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank we'll you, see you all next.